Alright, welcome to this quick tutorial on Cradle of Sins, the game, everything that's got in store for you. First thing you want to note with this game is it still currently boots to your desktop to start with. It does not immediately put you into VR, so don't expect the game to pop up in your headset when you first boot it. You'll come up to this menu here, which will have your quick play settings, um, as well as some chat. You have a shop that you can buy some custom avatars in when you play a little bit. Um, from here, you have a settings that's not currently implemented. Um, you have your profile, which you can go through here, pick some other avatars. Um, in the shop, you can choose to buy some of those with the coins you earn. You'll have challenges you can complete here, uh, weeklies and dailies, as per usual. Um, we'll jump back to home. You have a chat bar that you can open and close, um, but obviously, if you're here, you probably want to play the game. If there are people around, you can try quick play. Currently, the game doesn't have a huge population, so you're better off trying to get a group together, which will send you over to group play. Create your own lobbies. Currently, they just support public groups. You can hit create group. You can have people join on you, um, or you can join your own. And ultimately, if you don't find anybody else, you just want to play around, you can hit solo play. So at, when you're at this point, you're still on the desktop. You're still waiting to actually get in the game. Once you start up a game uh, with players or solo, you'll have to first pick a character. All the teams will lock in. If all the characters are locked in, you have a timer. They'll automatically go to zero and shoot you in. If you're still waiting or if you're in solo, as soon as you pick, um, it'll just toss you into a game. So you have four characters to choose from. Helena is an archer. Kira is a tank. Hexoth's a wizard, and Edward is kind of a brawler. We're going to go ahead and start with Edward and dive on in, and this will send us into VR finally. Once everyone has picked a character, or the timer countdown finishes, you'll be here, in your base looking up at your nexus. Behind you, you have three potion creation stations, which can be used to increase your stats, you have a series of items you can pick from on the right, or you have weapon upgrades on the left. You'll start with 200 gold, so personally, I like to either grab some potions or create some potions back here. To grab items, you reach out and simply grab them, which will purchase them. It'll put them in your chest slots. To use them, similarly grab them and pull the trigger. With cannons, pulling the trigger will set one out, and you simply drop it, and it will place it. The potion station will be something that's critical to your gameplay. You have seven different kinds of potions, as well as one that will reset the potion you're currently making. To purchase a potion, you simply grab an active potion and place it in one of the slots in the back. If you decide you want to sell it, you pick it up and drop it in the cauldron in the front. To mix potions, you toss a potion into the cauldron. It will give you, from the remaining potions, what are your options to combine with it. You drop that in and that will create a new potion. If you'd like to purchase this potion the same way, it'll tell you it's 200 gold. You take it and place it in the back. If you combine potions and decide that you don't want it, you can take this yellow vial and drop it in to clear the cauldron at any time. From there, you can take stronger potions, which you've already created, and you can combine them a second time with the remaining ingredients to make a third tier potion, which is notably different calls it an Icor, and costs significantly more gold. It'll cost the same as the original upgrade, or usually four or 600 if it's your original potion. On the screen, whenever you make a potion, you'll see the stat increase that it gives you, as well as your current stats. So it gives you an idea of what you're making, and if you decide that you don't want that, then you can create another potion by simply clearing out again. The components you have to work with are physical defense, magical defense, movement speed, Health, physical attack, magical attack, attack speed, and, as before, this one clears out the cauldron. The primary difference between the physical and magical seems to be that most attacks that are your primary attack, whether it's a physical projectile, a swing from a sword, those are going to be your physical attack damage values. Anything that uses an ability, which we'll talk about later, the abilities are the magical attack. I'll go ahead and throw up an image of, of all those really quick. followed by some of the potion combinations that you can see, which again are listed up here as you're creating potions. The next big mechanic you'll probably be interested in is weaponry and abilities. So in your base, you always have a choice of two weapons at any time. The first here is $300. When you pick a weapon, it'll give you 
two more weapon choices that are unique to that side. So if you pick the weapon on the left, it'll give you two weapons. If you pick the weapon on the right, it'll give you two different unique weapons. The second tier and highest tier is $600. Once you buy from this tier, you'll have the option to go back to $300 weapons, but there's really not a need unless you want to change over to the other branch. In addition, each weapon upgrade, the $300 and the $600 weapon upgrades, grants you a new ability. To cast your abilities, your first ability will always be press trigger and drag left. On Edward, that creates a flaming sword that will do AoE damage. Your second ability is a drag up. For him, that's minions. Your third ability will be a drag down, which here creates this bear trap. And your final ability is your ultimate ability. That will come at the start of the game with your first ability. And you activate that by pressing the A button on Rift. I'm not entirely sure what it is for other platforms. But those are your four abilities. Again, you start with one ability and your ultimate at the beginning. And as you buy your second and third weapon upgrades, then you gain those second and third abilities. So now the main objective of the game. What you eventually want to do is take down the Nexus here on your opponent's side. So as you're going along, basic movement is just with the stick or pad, but if you want to sprint, you swing your arms, and that will give you a sprint speed. And you'll have to keep doing this until you get where you're going. So a little bit of a physical element to the game. You move up your lanes here. As with any MOBA, creeps will periodically spawn, and you'll have to go through and clear them from the lane to advance with your minions. Alternatively, if you're feeling confident, you can go ahead and just dive straight through to your enemy's towers. Around each tower, there are a series of crystals, and you want to attack these along with your minions, ideally, to take down the tower. Once all six crystals have been knocked down, the tower will collapse and it will be defeated. Upon doing that, you gain a gold bonus for your entire team. On each side, there are two towers, followed by the main nexus. Additionally, the lane minions will give you a small amount of gold, so kill them whenever possible. You only get gold if you're the one to last hit, as compared to towers, which give your entire team gold. Again, don't forget about abilities. You have some of those, which are very useful, and you can use all of them at once if you so choose. Starting back from our base, our other option from the lanes is to move into the jungle. As you can see, I've picked up a couple of speed boosts, which are very useful. The first minion you might encounter is this sawmill minion. Killing this minion will lower your gold regeneration rate for your team by one, but give you a buff that increases your base's defense, a trade-off that you'll have to think through. You keep a better eye the other minion of the same type, but has no sawmill behind it, gives your team a gold bonus. Whenever you kill it, you get the gold that you would normally get for killing a jungle minion, and additionally it raises your gold regeneration by one per second. That one is a, kind of a must-have. The third minion that you can kill are these mages, which are rather strong in the early game, so you might want to watch out if you try to kill them immediately. These will give your lane minions a buff to their health and their damage. But again, this lowers your gold regeneration rate, so you may want to be careful if you're killing those. You have to make that trade-off. If you zoom through to your opponent's side, you can actually kill those same series of minions again and double up if there's something you want. So say you wanted to go for even more gold and they haven't killed their minion, you can kill theirs and you can boost your gold regeneration rate all the way up to four or five. Similarly with the other two minions, and you can double down on those buffs. After you've killed enough of the jungle minions and waited a sufficient amount of time, you'll encounter this boss who spawns Easiest way to find him is look for the wooden tower, or the rocky outcroppings, and you can kill him, and your entire team will get 500 bonus gold. He has a lot of health, so he can be a little bit tough to solo sometimes. Might be worth bringing a team. Additionally, throughout the jungle, there are a couple of hidden entrances like this, where you can pull the lever and open up a new pathway temporarily to let your team go through, or to try and sneak up on unsuspecting enemies. Aside from that, there's one more quirk of the jungle that's worth noting, which is throughout the jungle, or around other towers, there are a couple of trees, like this one, that have orange markings on them. If you hit them enough times, you can actually chop them down, which will open up the pathway to get through. Those take a little bit of work, so I usually don't cut them down, but if you feel like you need some more movement ability throughout the jungle, you can use those in the lever walls to really get around quickly. 
Aside from that, the jungle is excellent for sneaking up on enemies or just cutting through to the other side as fast as you can rather than going back to the base. If you ever do decide you need to go back to base and you're kind of wandering out here in the jungle, you can grab your compass, pull the trigger, it'll start a recall animation, and it'll send you back to the base after around five seconds. That's usually your quickest way to get back to base unless you have built up a whole lot of movement speed. Now we'll take a quick look at each of the individual characters. First one we'll look at is Edward. With Edward, you don't really have a whole lot of variety in your weapon choice. The main differences that they make are the amount of simulated weight that you'll get. On the melee characters, each weapon has a little bit of simulated weight to it. Um, on top of that, you can get a little bit more range with the long weapons and how they interact with physical objects, how easily they kind of slide off and around them. And on top of that, each one has a slight variation in the amount of attack or magical damage they do. Each weapon upgrade comes with more damage than the previous tier, but how much that actually changes is dependent on which weapon path you pick. You can pick the left weapons or the right weapons. If you start with the left weapon, it'll give you two unique weapons. The right one has its own unique tiers, um, which ends at this kind of blunted entry. The big weapons tend to have a little more simulated weight, but tend to hit a little bit harder. As for his abilities, first ability, Drag Up, will give you minions that spawn around you, which will help you in the lane. Sorry, that was your second ability. Your first ability is a flaming sword, which if you hit an enemy with it before the flames die off, it'll do an AoE attack to the minions around it, or players. Third ability allows you to lay a bear trap at your feet, which, which does damage to any enemy that walks over it, player or minion. And your final ability, your ultimate, cast with your right hand, does a big AoE effect that damages all the enemies within it. It's useful if you get into an engagement, you pop that and you have some control of the area. Makes the players have to think if they want to fight you or not. The third character, Helena, is an archer. All of her attacks are generally going to be ranged ones, but you can also, as with any character, walk up and beat your opponent to death. With her weapons, she actually does have one unique one, which is if you first buy the weapon on the left, which will end up being this bow with the yellow crystal, and then you buy this one over here with the blue crystal on the right, you acquire a three-shot special attack. When this projectile hits at close range, it does the normal damage for this second weapon tier, but if you actually manage to land all three on the same target, then you'll do considerably more damage also makes it easier for hitting targets that tend to dodge around a lot, whether that be players or enemies. Her abilities are first, a tornado that will stun enemies and do damage to them as it passes through. It's one of the few abilities that can hit more than one with one use. Your second ability, Drag Up, creates a wind tunnel that if you go through it will give you a burst of movement speed for about seven seconds. Her third ability, which you can get by the second weapon upgrade, adds poison to your arrow and allows you to do a damage over time shot if you connect with an enemy. I believe with this bow, if you manage to hit anyone with any three of the arrows that split off, all of them do poison damage, so it's particularly potent. And then her final ability, which is her ultimate, creates a cloud around you, which makes it so that players are significantly blinded and makes it very hard to see. Similar to the way that you are when you stand right in the wall, players are all around. So that's Helena. The final character of the group is Hexoth. All of his weapons are ranged, similar to Helena's, and can also be used for melee. He's notable because he has the widest variety of weapons. For one thing, the green staff and the blue staff on the opposite upgrade path are the only weapons in the game that have AoE abilities. When you hit something, they splash to all the enemies in a short proximity around. The Dragon Staff, as you can see before, has a triple shot ability. And then he also has a set of weapons, which include this five spine staff, as well as the $600 ice staff, which are able to charge up projectiles and shoot them all at once. Typically, this charge staff is considered the best in the game just because of its sheer ability to do high amounts of damage, as you can land five hits at once at a slightly reduced damage from the norm, but still more than any other weapon at once. It does take a while to charge, but his abilities do complement that. 
His first ability is a lightning strike that will chain to a few nearby enemies. You drag a left, aim at an enemy. If you don't hit anybody, it will not splash, so that's notable. His second ability, you drag up, puts up a projectile shield. Any projectiles sent from an enemy into the shield, either from inside or from outside, will be slowed down considerably and you'll be able to dodge them. His final ability is called Attack Link, which you drag down. Only works if you have another player in range. It will link you to that player, will tag them with three hits of damage if they stay in range, and then if they don't leave, that third hit will actually stun them for a short while. His ultimate ability, which comes at the beginning of the game with your first weapon, We'll wait just a moment here, see if we can get some enemies out. But it is a freeze ability that will lock enemies in place and prevent them from moving for a few seconds. You can still dodge while you're frozen, but there's a limited you know, functionality to that um, since you can only move within about a step or two away. So you hit the freeze, anything within the freeze radius, an unlimited number of enemies will get frozen. And that's a pretty powerful combo when you think that you can do that and then immediately unlock a five burst onto somebody. And that's Hexoth. The next character that we have is Kyra, the tank. Her weapons are all a series of hammers, which have a ranged attack built into them. Some of them have cool animations like this one that'll indicate that your ranged attack is back up, and you can use them for both melee and range. Similar to the skeleton, the weapons are mainly attack, damage, and magical damage upgrades, each one having a slight variation, and they give you an additional skill. There aren't really any special effects from any of them. Each one does have its own sort of simulated weight, however, so it may be worth trying out a different ones for yourself to see if the weight feels right, how you like it. Her abilities start off with, on the left, you drag over, and you get a shield that pops up around you if you're in combat, which only your enemies can see, and heals you as you go into battle. So you get more armor and healing, great way to initiate a fight. Your second ability creates a wall that comes up and you can use that to block enemies. If you trap enemies inside it, it will temporarily stun them. And it's just great for field presence. Similar with your last ability is kind of a zone of denial. Any enemies standing within the region surrounding your flag make it so they cannot use any of their abilities, which is extremely useful in a team fight. Your ultimate ability, which you gain at the beginning of the fight along with your first ability, drops a giant hammer in a place of your choosing. You press A to select it, and you can drop it about as far as, say, 10 paces away. It'll do a significant amount of damage, and will also stun enemies for a few seconds in it, allowing you to finish them off. Once you get later in the game, one thing you might consider is base defenses. As we talked about at the beginning, the first that you can do is a turret. These turrets will shoot any enemies that come into your area, and if they're players, will also apply a blind effect similar to Helena's ultimate ability. Additionally, you have these little pylons that you can pick up around your base, which, if you have the resources for it from killing the jungle sawmill minions, will apply these walls that come up. And you can put those up all around your base. Additionally, you have a drawbridge in the center, which you can pull up and put down, if you so choose. And then, eventually, I believe you will also be able to put up walls here, which are not currently implemented, but you can kind of see they've got a little bit of a door thing going on here, which I imagine that if you pull this back, it'll implement some kind of door. So when you finally break into your opponent's base, and the game is about to be over, you'll see the final of the crystals getting knocked down. And when you finally do it, you get a giant victory message. This will send you back out of VR, onto your desktop client after a few seconds, and it will end up showing you a stat screen for all the players that participated. You get a nice little bit of applause there, and it'll show you the stats for your game. Typically, you get a little bit over a thousand points if you win in a multiplayer match, um, obviously more if you have other players to compete against. So it'll show the items you purchased, names, and stats. So from here, you can go ahead and continue. You'll be back in a desktop client. And from there, it's kind of rinse and repeat. You can dive back into your next game. You can find some new players. Or you can hop off and call it a day. Thanks for watching the tutorial.